Welcome back. I'm going to introduce myself as Steve McDonald is outside shepherding people back in. My name is Liz McClintock. Uh, I'm a managing partner and one of the founders of a small organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts called CM Partners. And it is, um, comes from the, a long pedigree of which uh, Ambassador McDonald and Dr. Diamond are of a part. So it's a pleasure for me to be here and a privilege to be the moderator for this August panel uh, this afternoon. So I just want to go through the ground rules one more time so that our panelists are aware and all of you are aware. So we're going to only have uh, 10 to 12 minutes for each of these speakers so that we have uh, some time for question and answer. I will uh, just give you a two minute warning. How's that? And then you'll know. Uh, we'll go in order. Uh, alphabetical order by first name, so <laughs> no, no, actually it's alphabetical order by last name. And uh, so we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Abu Nimer, and then we'll come over here to Emmanuel Bernard, then uh, Dr. Hirschfeld will speak, and then we'll end with uh, Dr. Wolpe. Uh, both uh, Mohammed and Dr. Hirschfeld have to leave a bit early, so don't be offended. I, they're going to stay as long as they possibly can for up till the last moment of the question and answer, if possible, but they may have to get up and, and leave a bit earlier. Uh, the, they're going on. The, the events in Egypt have have sparked other panels and other discussions, and they've, in their own capacity, have been requested to go off and, and in participate in other discussions. So, uh, we thank them for being here, and also Emmanuel and Howard. So, just we heard earlier about the conceptual framework, and now we'll have an opportunity uh, to hear from for people who have quite a bit of experience in the field, I think what struck me in the earlier panel uh, was when, and I think it was Ambassador McDonald, spoke about the multi-track process as offering an opportunity for innovation, risk-taking, and imagination. And that struck me as being incredibly important for the work that we do. And it seems that the the practical work led to a conceptual framework which now has led others to return to the field and continue the practical work and it is an iterative, iterative learning process in which we are all engaged. So uh, we're especially appreciative to have all four of them here today. Uh, I will not go through their bios, you have them in front of you and again I think as uh, Karen Dickman said earlier each one of them could probably have a book written about them so um, <laughs> it, I would not do them justice. So it, it's a pleasure to have you here. We'll start um, with Professor Abu Nimer who's a professor of course at American University and uh, he will begin. Thank you. Uh, good evening or afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm sorry again if I leave a few minutes before and I have no uh, idea that uh, we did not coordinate that so this is not Israeli Palestinian uh, pull out from here um, I mean another panel at the AU on uh, Egypt and the recent event that was planned for the last uh, uh, two weeks or, or since the beginning of this uh, event in Egypt um, just I have very little limited time so I had to choose what areas of practice I will share with you um, and I've uh, chosen three areas that I've worked with the, in them uh, for the uh, last probably or since I started the practice uh, Israel Palestine and in Egypt uh, since 90 since 1999 since 93 actually the first time I began working in Egypt and the third one is Sri Lanka where actually uh, I, I went to the IMTD team, uh, Luis and uh, John, we went to Sri Lanka in 1996, that was my first time, and since then I've been continuing to work in uh, Sri Lanka uh, as well. Um, I guess I'll start from the last uh, point, in the last the question from the last panel of the how, uh, and this will be the focus in terms of the methods and the technique that we have used in uh, in these uh, in these areas, or I have used as a practitioner as well. 
But just a quick note, I love the stories and the narration of the IMTD, and I should also contribute to that. I was, uh, uh, I arrived like Bertoli, but three years before to, to ICAR uh, in 89, with also broken English, that continued to be the case also for me. <laughs> And I was here with Simona Sharoni, who was an Israeli uh, peace activist, and we were sort of working in the same area in Israel, uh, Palestine at that time. And uh, uh, John uh, called uh, from the Iowa Peace Institute and said, how about coming to Iowa and talk about the Intifada? And we thought this is an excellent opportunity, but we didn't know what we're signing for. And uh, we got to Iowa Peace Institute, and we done over 70 uh, lectures in about uh, six or seven days, basically covering all the <laughs> all the areas in Iowa. And uh, at the end, it was it was one of my I think best uh, uh, trips that I I've done in terms of public speaking. It was really learning about the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, culture, the U.S. society, and the most of all, spending six days with the. Crystal and John, and since then I've kept in touch. And my my second really uh, a trip with him was uh, to Sierra Leone in 1996, in the height of the military uh, invasion of the capital, actually. And we did a workshop there also for Care International, that led us to Guatemala, and after that led us to Sri Lanka, or led me uh, to Sri Lanka, and and. Uh, it, uh, as, as a young practitioner at that time also, it was, it was really uh, life-changing opportunities and doors that were open by the IMTD uh, in, in that time. So when I finished my uh, PhD work, IMTD or the, the nine tracks were the first thing that I saw and used in terms of international peace-building work. And I guess that's also kept, with, kept it with me until today. With, with lots of uh, questions and challenges they uh, faced. Um, I, I guess that the first question that I, or the main question I wanted to, uh, to respond to, how do we integrate the, the multi-track diplomacy in our work in these areas? Well, in Israel, Palestine, I've been involved in uh, multiple uh, areas and also tracks, uh, but the most of them is really the inter-ethnic inter dialogue. So I've done about, since 1981, I was freshman, uh, uh, sophomore in, in the university, and I began facilitating dialogue groups between Arabs and Jews, and then uh, with kids, and then started after that with high school uh, teachers, and then after that community leaders, and later on even with some, uh, with some politicians. And when I got burned out, I left the country for the Arabs and Jews to solve their, their conflict, and I came to the U.S. to do my Ph.D., but I never really got rehabbed from that conflict. I, I continue <laughs> to be uh, uh, sort of hooked into it and, and addicted to the dynamic of it. Uh, um, though that's one track. The other track was the protest. I was peace activist for since I was in seventh grade, I could say. I was trained this way and uh, brainwashed uh, in a good way at that point and uh, continued to be peace activist on the Palestinian side and then Israeli Palestinian movement as well. So there is some work on, uh, on, on the issue of uh, a peace resistance and protest movement. The third track is the religion interfaith dialogue that I've been also doing some uh, community work among the religious leaders and the clergy, which I think is one of the weakest link and weakest uh, levels in that context. Um, in, uh, like, like in Israel, Palestine, similarly in, in Sri Lanka, when we uh, reached Sri Lanka, we really were introduced to a development agency. Uh, we went to Guatemala for about 60 or 70 care international uh, managers, and they invited us after that to come and practice how would we do this multi-track diplomacy work in Sri Lanka. I don't know, Sri Lanka and Israel-Palestine are both intractable and deep-rooted uh, conflict or dynamics. So, and they gave us care, I recall, if you recall, Luis, we, they flew us from here to Guatemala five days. We spent there, uh, but we got only 75 minutes in five days program. It was like a salesperson. You had to come in 75 minutes, convince 60 managers, country director, that uh, peace building and development are really linked. Somehow we managed to convince one of them, 
uh, and Steve invited us to Sri Lanka, and there he said, here is the organization, 200 Sinhalese, Muslim and Tamil worker I have, I want you to train them, and that's what we began doing, training them into peace building, conflict resolution, uh, dialogue, and trying to integrate uh, peace building into this huge development agency. Uh, and from there, uh, Luis and others continue to work in the head headquarter in Atlanta, uh, bringing the system approach into development and peace in, in the CARE organization. Um, but locally for me, really, uh, CARE adopted the, the approach and they decided among the first few organizations to create a project or a department or some new unit in Sri Lanka called VOICE to integrate peace building and development because most of their staff said, listen, we're here to do relief and development and we're not experts for peace building. We don't know how to do it. It's better for you to put it in one of these corners and those two or three staffs that we'll hire, they will mainstream peace building into our development work. And as you know from gender work and from many other uh, mainstreaming themes, this usually get uh, uh, sidelines or marginalized. Nevertheless, the work with CARE, I think, continued, and uh, from there I began working with the second track in Sri Lanka, working with the peace secretariat, the Muslim peace secretariat, uh, because Senalese and Tamil had each one of them their own peace secretariat, and the Muslim were a minority, about 8% in Sri Lanka, and the government during the peace process said, you're, you're, you're a member of the Sri Lankan uh, government, and you should not have your own track. So the entire project was, how do you get the voice of the Muslim community from the uh, conflict-affected area into the peace negotiation when they themselves don't have representation into the, on the negotiation table. And that process was called One Text Initiative, which is, I think, one of the classic examples structured in how do you connect a track one, track two, and uh, uh, tra the politicians and then the uh, peace builder and also the community in that sense. Uh, um, and recently began working also in interfaith dialogue in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka and Palestine are different from Egypt for one single reason. In Egypt, the, the regime, uh, 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 the regime is, is collapsed or collapsed after 18 years. In Israel, Palestine, and in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, the dynamic of the power relation and the military establishment managed actually to do the exact opposite. They managed to crush the achievements of the track, multi-track diplomacy in these contexts. In both Israel, Palestine, but in Sri Lanka, even more brutal when the government the troops managed to uh, stop the negotiation and engage in uh, open war with the uh, LTT and basically have 25,000 people killed and uh, 270,000 people IDPs. And uh, today, I was a month ago in Sri Lanka, uh, peace building is, is, a, is a bad word. In fact, our local host says we no longer want to talk about peace or peace building because uh, the war ended and we should find different terminology right now because it's very dangerous with the government to even use such terminology. Uh, so I see it as more of a regression in that sense. Uh, some success is there, but I think overall in a macro picture, it's really one of the unfortunate cases for uh, how the uh, track one, uh, particularly the military establishment, managed to kidnap or take control of what we call peace processes and peace building, peace building work. Israel, I think, also similar case with the Palestinian uh, context. Uh, the, the Israeli uh, government and the Palestinian Authority, uh, both in, in that sense, including Hamas, uh, did not give as much as help. Uh, to the to the multi-track uh, multi-track multi aspects uh, in Egypt, I've done thank you. In Egypt, I've done lots of work with the, uh, with about um, on inter intercultural dialogue. They call it, and uh, in that project, we have worked with 500 intellectual leaders and community leaders in the Egyptian public opinion uh, makers uh, for about eight years right now. But the main accomplishment was that to convince and to train people. Uh, and the notion that the problem in Egypt is not between a Christian and Muslim. The problem in Egypt is about regime relation with uh, people regardless of their religion and ethnicity and in many times the regime itself 
used to manipulate that ethnic dynamic, as you heard, that even some of the uh, government official might have a, a role in the explosion, in the, in, in the Alexandria recent explosion. And those uh, people who were trained have uh, representation in all the provinces, districts of Egypt, and they've been working as one of the groups that contributed to that. Mm -hmm. Those are the three cases. I want to skip to the uh, challenges because I think the first panel did a great job in inspiring you. So my job is to bring the balance here. Uh, we have lots of problems in bringing multicultural, multi-track diplomacy into conflict areas. And some of these core challenges continue to, I think, obstruct our work. Part of them are internal, but also there are other parts that external. Um, I'll, I'll share with you, I think, just in, in the title, a couple of them, or a few of them in the beginning. Um, one of the things I think our failure to incorporate media and technology into our work. Many times we do the work of peace building with very little attention and awareness to the potential use of media, which is one of the tracks in multi-track diplomacy. And I don't think we have mastered or even uh, scratched the, the, the surface of how do peace building programs Capital, can capitalize on, on, the, on the media and the power of the media. The second one is more painful because I think it's internal, even more internal, has to do with our lack of coordination. In any given day in Sri Lanka where I work, if you go to a community, you can find uh, at least uh, 10 to 15 different international agencies and probably about 40, 50 local agencies. And they all live in very small parts. You were talking about the whole and the parts. We all live in our divisions and we don't communicate, rarely, no coordination among our efforts and even sometimes the donor will themselves not create such coordination. The coordination within the peace building community in the conflict area, I think is, is one of the major disasters uh, that uh, I would say self-inflicted in, in that sense and it reduced the impact that we have. Uh, the third component that we have we, we can communicate with ambassadors and diplomats, and, uh, and we do that, we coordinate with them sometimes. We have no language yet to create in how do we communicate with the military establishment, with the security forces in Sri Lanka and Israel, Palestine, and also in, uh, in, in uh, Egypt. Of course, the language in Egypt was very clear for the last 18 months, and I think that's a very good lesson for many of us. But as a field, we don't have yet tools and I think to some extent experience in reaching out to the military and to the security and to the, in fact many of us still have, still live into this, this moral beacon or moral, moral superiority where, where we don't even talk to military people because supposedly they are the evil, they're the one that we are doing the cleanup behind and therefore we don't engage with them. We're the peacenik, we love to be together and we love to be supported by each other and we have a language and terminology for that. But in the real world, at the end of the day, you need the military and you need the estab that establishment that at the end of the day, this is what <laughs> de determine our work in Sri Lanka and in Israel, Palestine. I've sat in Gaza a checkpoint, in the West Bank checkpoint, hours and hours and hours, and then I get a young man of a 20 year, 21 years old coming to me uh, and say, would you like to go in? Or he holds the permission for me to go in and go out. And he have no clue what I am doing and what type of contribution I could make to reduce the pain in his life. And I have no language even to talk to him. Uh, not only no access, but no language. <laughs> access is an issue. I will uh, talk about transferring achievement. We're very good in transforming people individually, magically. Give us, pe give us people for five days in a closed room like this with food and music, and at the end of the five days, you get them magically transformed into peace activists or peace workers. Some of them will go to do great work, but we don't have yet the tools in how do we take that impact into the policy work. And I will finish with the last point. We can tell... Uh, amazing stories, and you hear those stories. But the stories are not always enough to provide evidence in terms of the impact of our field. Today, you can hear many stories about how Egyptian civil society, Egyptian peacemakers, Egyptian protest, a protest a, a movement have accomplished with their objective. 
but we don't have much studies and systematic way to measure the impact of our work. In that area, I think we're still in the kindergarten uh, part. These are uh, some of my thoughts on this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So please write down your questions, and we will get to the question and answer period afterwards. We're going to now let uh, Emmanuel Bernard speak. She comes to us from UNDP. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that I'm, of course, absolutely honored to be sitting here among um, very impressive uh, panelists and in this room with you all. I'm um, standing in for Chetan Kumar, who's the director, um, who's the head of the conflict prevention team at the Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery in the United Nations Development Program. Um, I, I work with Chetan in, uh, in a team of, of five people at, at this bureau in UNDP who work on conflict prevention. And, and uh, the purpose of the team is to really provide technical support to um, UNDP country offices, to UN country teams and to, you know, national counterparts in the field in, you know, um, designing and implementing conflict prevention programs. So what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of an overview of um, or of a idea of where where we may be uh, fitting into um, a sort of multi-track or system approach uh, when it comes to um, conflict prevention, peace building um, and, and obviously multi-track uh, diplomacy. Well, the UN is really an organization where, um, you know, you find in one body um, people who are intervening at several levels, so in several of the, of the, of the multiple tracks that we can find. Um, you have the government, the official political track um, taken on uh, by, obviously, the Secretary General and his representatives, whether directly in country or at the regional level. And then you have um, agencies like UNDP who are really... Um, particularly for the case of UNDP, focusing on capacity building. So what, what UNDP tries to do in conflict prevention is to really help countries develop internal capacities for managing um, <coughs> rising tensions, for mitigating tensions, for preventing conflict or the adverse burst of violence um, themselves. So we try to help them develop these capacities. It's really a support role uh, in that sense. The, in an ideal world, um, you know, obviously countries would be able to manage these on their own and not need um, outside mediation. So we try to come in really early on on the preventive side, prevention side. And, and um, one concept that we try to use is the concept of infrastructures for peace and help countries develop these infrastructures at the national level, at the community level, um, with government mechanisms, with civil society, to really deal with, with tensions before they, they sort of explode into um, or become dangerously close to, to exploding into violence. And that happens really in what we do at both the national level and the community level. I, I want to emphasize that. I'll explain that later. Um, so in terms of, of this, is, this is where we fit in, I think the focus in, and often we have an issue of language, we, we use different words sometimes to mean the same thing, sometimes with a clear idea that it's, it's talking about different things, whether it's peace building, conflict prevention, violence prevention, uh, mediation, dialogue. Um, that's a bit of a challenge that we have at UNDP, whether working um, amongst, you know, with colleagues within UNDP or with partners um, in the rest of the UN or outside the UN. Uh, just in terms of the how, obviously UNDP is a very um, um, sort of operations-oriented agency. We try to do things. We have money to implement, to design activities and implement them. So when it comes to conflict prevention, what we try to do, and this we try to do jointly with the Department of Political Affairs, given that conflict prevention is such a... Um, sensitive and often political thing, even though we don't intervene as UNDP at that political level, we, we try to intervene at sort of some of the other tracks. I was going to say lower tracks, but really there are other tracks. Um, what everything that we do, I think the first, the, the first thing here is everything that we do is we, we try to base it on, obviously, a clear understanding of the conflict dynamics. I say this because we try to work in countries where, which are not necessarily high profile conflicts we try to um again in this in the sort of um 
in the line of, of prevention, working countries like Benin, working countries that don't have a UN political mission, that don't have a lot of international attention, uh, but where we see, um, you know, signs of, of rising tensions and, and where we see a potential for helping those countries uh, strengthen their own their infrastructures for peace. You know, we, it can go from Kenya, which is fairly high profile, obviously, to Ghana, to Benin, to Togo. Um, this is where really we try to bring our our value added um, as a partner to both national authorities so, and also civil society, non government partners, and also um, as opposed to bilateral partners. We we try to be we try to take advantage of the fact that we can be perceived as a neutral partner in, in terms of um, because we're a multilateral development partner, we, we try to use that approach to address sensitive issues. So one thing um, that, that we, we really base our work on is so a clear understanding of the conflict dynamics, root causes of conflict, proximate factors of conflict when we go into a, a, a country. And once we've done that, we, uh, that helps us identify um, you know, the most appropriate approaches or, or tracks to try and address these issues or try to help the national, the national partners address this, these issues. When it comes to conflict prevention, peace building, um, I think other, other people have said it already, some governments will not want to hear about it, not want to hear the word conflict, conflict prevention, peace building, anything like that. So it, it can be a challenge to find entry points um, to provide some of the support that 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 we 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 aim at providing, one method that we've used is really, um, and that's only started four or five years ago, uh, by deploying what we call peace and development advisors on the ground quickly, um, usually initially for a short period of three four months, and then later on for longer longer periods. And these are the people who really go in and actually do the groundwork. Uh, who really go in and try to build trust, try to find champions of peace um, uh, in the government, in civil society, uh, with traditional leaders, try to gather all these people, speak to them, do the groundwork to make sure that um, uh, there is more of a possibility to create forums of dialogue. I'm, um, Ambassador McDonald was saying earlier that the only way to solve a conflict and to, to prevent it is to sit down and, and talk about it. So this, so creating spaces for, for dialogue is obviously something that we try to, to do a lot. And these peace, peace and development advisors are really on the ground doing um, the day-to-day -day work on that, uh, whether it's uh, speaking to people, sometimes training, um, um, you know, supporting, sometimes in, in some of the countries, helping make sure that people have a place to meet, a meeting room, um, you know, transportation. It goes from the very pragmatic, nitty-gritty to the, the, the bigger picture. Um, one uh, thing that we can do from, that we, we try to do at headquarters level is to um, advocate for this within the UN system for, you know, um, to strengthen the, the, the peace architecture and to strengthen the place of development, the understanding that there is a link between development, conflict prevention, and peace building within the UN system and outside the UN system. One thing that, I, that we've done, for example, is um, uh, we held a conference last year in Naivasha, Kenya, on infrastructures for peace, where invited, we're invited uh, 14 um, African countries represented um, three-way by the, a member of government, a member of civil society, and a representative of the UN system. And we uh, went away for three days and talked about the concept of peace, co conflict prevention, infrastructure for peace, what everybody can do, and how the UN system can help. And um, quite a few countries left there with, um, or quite a few people left there with a common sort of... Um, Understanding and a common idea that things can be done with the support of development partners when it comes to conflict prevention. And uh, from that meeting, we actually were able to develop um, several programs in conflict prevention, um, including in, in Togo, for example, or in Benin. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I think that uh, that's, that's the big picture of the methodologies or the approaches that we have to conflict prevention and to operationalize some of the concepts that were, that were talked about today. Uh, challenges, 
you know, when, when we were mentioning earlier how to capitalize on the media, UNDP has a lot of programs trying to support the media in conflict prevention, whether in Guinea-Bissau, in many different countries. And it's true that we're, it's still a, a work in progress in terms of finding the lessons learned for what's been done in the past and how to use the money and the technical expertise most efficiently um, towards conflict prevention and peace building. So not just training journalists, we have a few of them in the room, um, to cover um, you know, political developments in a fragile context in a way that is um, that doesn't um, heighten tensions, but how to do more than that. Uh, so there, there's quite a few challenges that remain, and and um, one that we we are trying to address now with whatever means we have is also how to report on the impact of some of our activities, because that's, that's obviously very important, not only to our donors, but to also continuing knowing where to um, where to improve or um, strengthen our work. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. <laughs> now I'll pass the microphone to Dr. Hirschfeld, who is the Director General of the Economic Cooperation Forum. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful I was only asked at the, la I'm the last moment got on board. So, but it'll be easy to get out, I'll have to apologize. Um, and I'll try to be as fast as possible. I've worked for 31 years on Track 2 activities, um, with some quite substantial successes and with far more um, failures. Um, what I will give you now are the basic goals, um, uh, one success story um, and one failure. I'm not going to give you a failure where Tech 2 actually causes damage. Um, this also happens. Um, but this would take another session, and I don't want to be. Um, but actually, um, this is what I'm going to give you. If you look at the rules, um, there are three basic rules for anyone who deals in Tech 2 activity. And um, I think many people have the first two, very few have the third. Um, the first is you need a strategic understanding of what you're doing. You need the historical context in, in what's to come. The, um, the conflict emerges um, and um, you have to have a clear strategic set of um, how, how do you know, how do, how do you be able also to develop not only strategy of the past but also look forward to the strategy of the present and the future. The strategic understanding is a means, is only effective if you've got access to decision makers. And you need access to decision makers where you actually can uh, show their doors and you can fight with them and you have a discussion with them, obviously on a substantial issue or not, not on being angry or something like this. And, um, but the access to decision makers is essential if you want to, if it's not only a um, peace engagement of peace lovers one with the other, but you want it actually to change reality. The third one is, un in, is normally by many few people in, in our field of peace, tend to have humility because we believe that we're always absolutely right. We have a very moral kind of looking at things and we don't fully always understand that we do not have the full legitimacy um, to make decisions. I'll put this into Israeli terms. We have um, wonderful peacemakers in Israel who represent maybe two or three members of Knesset and they have to understand that in order to push things ahead you need a majority in the Knesset and not only two or three members. And um, this relates to some of the activities that's been done in this context. Humility means that you work, you work with um, with decision makers, with politicians who you may not like at all, who you may not agree with all, who you may dislike their 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 mode of thinking. You may dislike it, but they can make it happen, and therefore. The humility, I believe, is a very, very important um, factor in knowing what you can achieve and what you cannot achieve. Um, and um, I believe these three things are very essential for any Tech 2 activity, activist to, to work and be successful. Um, if we work and we move into working and we want to be successful, um, my little organization and I myself, we work on three levels, one after the other, and they're very much connected to each other. They are not uh, s in sequence, but they often go together. The first 
Um, <laughs> the first uh, very important part is what we call concept building. At the beginning in 1983, I was working with Simon Perez on one hand and with Elias Fredsch, the mayor of Bethlehem, on the other hand. And um, the, um, our government wanted to, to uh, um, ask um, Elias Fredsch to resign. And he and myself were sitting in his municipality and we had phone talks. And Elias Fredsch would say to me, yeah, yeah, I've got one advice to you. Um, before you speak, first listen. So concept building is built is built basically on listening, listening to the different stakeholders in the conflict. You listen to the other side carefully, you listen to your own people, um, you listen um, to, as um, Professor um, Andrea pointed out, this is track one, track two, there are many track ones, you listen to all of them together in order to know what the concept is, where there can be common ground. And, um, um, the, there are many, um, I've been in, in take two activities where the concept wasn't uh, accurate enough and it failed because of that. But the concept is the best, it is actually, actually looking at common ground. In one, when I prepared the, the concept of the Oslo papers, I had a paper which I gave to Palestinian and Israeli decision makers, and the Palestinian strategist did something terrible to me. He took a red pen and he corrected my paper with red pen. And at the first moment, I was insulted. Um, but at the second moment, I understood that he had given me the right language for negotiations. He had changed the same words into different words, and I had given me actually the language of negotiations. So. Um, Concept building has many parts to it. I have no time to go into it. But in order to be effective in doing concept building, there is already a beginning of coalition building. You have to have a coalition building on, on, from the Israeli point of view on all three sides. The Israeli coalition, the Palestinian coalition, and the American coalition. Sometimes the American coalition is the most difficult one, but I don't want to go into that. Um, but you want... You want to have a coalition. I speak to the settler movement. I speak to the right-wing people. My people say, you know, why do you speak to those guys? Say, you know, this is in the end, I, the, 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 uh, the settlers accused me of speaking to Palestinians. They were terrorists. They said, if you put the Canadians as my, as my uh, neighbors, I will speak to the Canadians. If you put another government in power, I will speak to a more peace government. But I have to speak to those people who are decision makers. We do this in coalition, in coalition building. You build coalition between different institutions, between the security establishment, which, by the way, are strong in the security establishment. Um, uh, we do this with the security establishment. You do this with the foreign office. You do with the prime minister's office. You do this with different other actors, and on both also on the Palestinian side. And capacity building is for us, track two actors, far more difficult. We do a little bit. Normally, we leave it to others. In, um, the question is how do you interact between track one and track two, and how do you create a f a uh, a f an effective interaction? In Oslo, at the, at the first meeting, I gave Abu Ala a paper which had less written on it than here. It had four words, fact-finding, authorization, which I meant partial authorization, legitimization, I said, which was creating the legitimacy, and breakthrough. To at track two, if you go for strategy development or for negotiations, what the first thing is fact, fact finding on the concept, is there common ground? Is there a zone of possible agreement? How do you develop, is there the basis for it? And you can come out with the understanding that there's no basement. I'll give you an example where this is the case. Um, but the fact finding is the first activity you have to go through. If you've gone through on track two on fact finding, you obviously have to report to track one and then go back to, to, to your, in our case, Palestinian interlocutors and tell them we have partial authorization. In the case of Oslo, this was a very, very dramatic one. I was asked at the second meeting to ask Abu Lai at what stage Chairman Arafat would like to come to Arafat, uh, to Gaza. Um, obviously, as a track two man, I couldn't, I couldn't invite Arafat at night to come to Gaza. I had to have, give, uh, had to have support for it. So you need a certain kind of authorization from, from, from track one. In order then to make it happen, you have to build the legitimacy of the concept you're developing. You have to build the legitimacy, probably publicly, and I agree with you that we do too little, we use too little media in doing this, but you have to develop the legitimacy, legitimacy in order to get the government convinced that they can move ahead and do these things. It's the third fact. If you've done this, if, if the fact-finding is positive, if the 
partial authorization has been given and you build legitimacy for it, you can reach for the breakthrough. The breakthrough is something very, very, very painful for track two actors. It means actually you get out of the picture and track one does the job. Um, and you have to be able to do that. In the case of Oslo, it had another effect, which I, um, they p partly changed the concept, which I'm sad about, but it's another issue. But you want to actually to get to, you need these four stages, these four phases to move ahead. Now, I'll give you a short example of a um, success story, and I'll give you a late example. In 2006 and 2007, um, Prime Minister Olmert and, um, and actually the Bush administration and President Abbas prepared for, for Annapolis and prepared for some other things. And uh, we developed, uh, on the long way, and I have no time to go and explain how and why, we developed the concept of what we call Janine First. Janine First was a very important component in the bottom-up approach, built state building from the ground, improved the security situation in the entire region of the north of the West Bank, make, make access and movement easier, um, create security cooperation between the Israeli and the secu Palestinian security forces, give an encouragement for trade and for economic ex ex activities. Um, it was, um, uh, the way we worked is that we worked, um, we, we, on one hand, we worked with um, people, with Salam Fayyad in one, the beginning directly, afterwards with expert, experts. We had very, very close dialogue with General James Jones and General Keith Staten. Um, two um, emissaries from the, the still at that time from the Bush, the, um, Bush administration. Um, we developed the concept of Geneva first. There was strong opposition from the IDF on it. Um, in a day in July 2008, um, General Jones came to see Gilad Sher, Baruch Spiegel and myself and complained bitterly about our government. Gilad Sher was the chief negotiator of Barak, um, phoned Barack on the moment and said, if you do not change this, this will have a negative impact on U.S.-Israeli relations. And from that moment on, um, Barack and Gabi Ashkenazi went on and they started to move on the concept and they started to work on that list. So it was us to, in this case, it was us to the Americans, from the Americans to Barack and General Ashkenazi, our chief of staff, and from there to Fayyad Beck. And um, the Janine thing started to become a success. It's become a success far beyond Janine. It's gone to the south of it. The state building, the security cooperation has been very, very serious. It's reached a certain top, and we have to be go beyond the top. But it has been quite a successful story. I'll give you the... Um, so the capacity building then was that Fayyad did the state building. Dayton did the IDF and PSF cooperation. And the local authorities worked on it. I'll give you a short failure story, which I believe is partly a success story. Um, we worked in the Baker Institute for Public Policy on um, a territorial endgame. And we found out that the, um, that the, the fact finding found out that the territorial agreement between Israel and Palestine must be somewhere around the 4% swap concept. 3.8%, 4.2%, but that's the area where there is where, where, where an agreement makes sense. And we found out that this, under the present Israeli government, there's no way, there's no way that the Israeli government is going to go for an agreement on these things. So we are going to the American government, and also I think this would be a wonderful idea, and we, will go, we are telling the American government, don't fall in the trap you fell in the f f settlement freeze issue. On the settlement freeze issue, if it's total, we told the American government it will have three effects. It will, you push the Israeli government on something it will not be able to deliver. We've got the majority of its own constituency it will be widely against it in the Knesset and outside. The, um, then if you push the Israeli government to do something, they will not deliver in a very awkward manner. Um, the United States will look like a paper tiger. And then you've put the United the Palestinians up on a tree where they cannot come down of it and you can't move ahead. And if the, if the United States government would today put a, the border between Israel and Palestine on the, on the table, the same three pitfalls would happen. I think this is an important outcome of a track two activity, but it is a failure. It is a failure and means that we have to look in another way to see where the zone of possible agreement is and work on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> okay, and for our last panelist, I'll pass the mic to Dr. Howard Wolpe, who is the former 
director of the Africa program here at the Wilson Center, amongst many of his hats that he has worn. And as he mentioned earlier, he's now retired and going to write one of many books, at least, <laughs> in the next 12 months. Thanks very much, Liz. Or the microphone. microphone. Yeah. Um, I am delighted to be here today and to participate in this panel, and also to reunite with uh, so many of my friends and colleagues with whom I've worked over the last many years. Um, I wanted to say a word about, particularly pleased to have Andrea here. Uh, Saint Egidio, I'd always said to everyone I've worked with, was the best part of my job. Now you might think it's, it's a remarkable institution. I mean, it really is. The ethos is, I've never been more uncomfortable with a religious institution in my life. Um, and, uh, but the other part of the, of, of the attraction of Saint Egidio was that Don Mateo, uh, was uh, the Africa specialist, knows his wines. And so whenever we were in St. Egidio, we had the most wonderful dinners on uh, an ongoing basis. Um, my work in this area of conflict transformation, multi-track diplomacy, emerged out of my frustrations as first a policymaker in Congress uh, over many years, and then as a diplomat working on the Burundi and on the Congo Wars. Um, we had an approach which simply said, uh, Put, we, the international community would put a lot of pressure on leaders to sign agreements. Uh, now, of course, I didn't mean the next day the leaders saw the world any differently than the day before, or that they trusted each other, or that they had any more commitment the day after to begin working on the issues that had divided them. And then we had a template, literally a template, a checklist. And it was a checklist that was developed on a deductive analysis of Western experience in terms of what were the factors that appeared to produce stable democracies in the West. And so you end up with checks and balances, uh, free media, uh, independent electoral commissions, and you go through this whole checklist. And forgetting that the, the fundamental problem in war-torn societies is that they are divided societies in which the key elements of the society don't feel connected to one another, in which they don't often even share a common sense of nation nationality. And then we develop a whole set of strategies that are devised to focus on the building of structures, of institutions, and of encouraging competitive capacity. I served on the board of directors of the National Endowment for Democracy for years. We kept giving all this money to ID, NDI and RII, IRI and so, to build political capacities so people could compete better at election time. The challenge in a divided society is not to strengthen competitive capacities, it's to strengthen collaborative capacities. But we have had no tools, no processes, no institutions. It has simply not been the part of our culture. And so when I left government and moved over to the private, to, here to the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, the, uh, the World Bank brought me on as a consultant to think with the bank about post-conflict strategies in, the, in Central Africa and the Great Lakes region. And I said to the bank that in my view, this structural institutional approach would never yield sustainable peace. Uh, that you had to begin to deal with leaders themselves, with their mindsets, with the way they saw the world, um, with their fears, with their suspicions, or peace would never be sustainable or it would always be uh, very fragile. I, I suggested, in fact, that there were four principal challenges that you had to address if there was to be successful and sustainable peace in any society. I would suggest these have application to Egyptian, Egypt's evolution now. The first of these imperatives is to change the, tra the conflict paradigm or the, or the war paradigm, which sees politics as a zero-sum game in which one person's victory or success can only come at the expense of the other guy. There is no recognition of the value of collaboration, even with one's competitors. 
And unless people come to understand collaboration with others as a matter of enlightened self-interest, I don't think you can make peace sustainable anywhere. Secondly, you've got to restore the trust and rebuild the relationships that have been fractured by the conflict. So that when people make agreements, they can have confidence that those agreements will be honored. Thirdly, you've got to build a new consensus on the rules of the game. How is power going to be organized? How will it be shared? Who will be invited to the decision-making table? And then finally, you've got to strengthen the communications and negotiation skills of key leaders so that they have the capacity to better understand, to put themselves in the shoes of the other and therefore have the capacity to identify solutions that can satisfy the fundamental interests of all parties. Now, and so what I propose to the World Bank is that we try an experiment. And the first location <coughs> for the experiment was going to be Burundi, a society that had just signed a peace agreement that no one thought would stick. You'd had um, a humanitarian disaster, about 350,000 people killed in the previous few years, a genocide in 1972 that claimed the lives of over 150,000 Hutus. You had a totally traumatized society and a polarized leadership, a large gap between the leaders and the population, uh, total inequality in the distribution of resources. Those who controlled the apparatus of the state had access to the economy. Everyone else was excluded. And you had a very fragmented peace process. And so I suggested to the bank that we attempt to strengthen this peace process that had begun in Arusha some years earlier by launching a long-term training process involving an, our initial goal was very modest, about 95 to 100 leaders working in groups of 30 or 35, half of them to be drawn from the so-called political class, by which we included not only the politicians, but also the army and all of the rebel groups. And one half to be drawn from civil society, from women's groups, from the media, from academics, from the churches, um, because we did not want to bring just the, the ruling class together and end up creating a stronger mafia. We wanted to bring both civil society, the grassroots, together with leaders to begin to strengthen lines of accountability and communication between these. Um, and I was, was successful in bringing two world-class trainers in, led by Liz McClintock, uh, who are, do magical work in this process. Another uh, Land Limperer from um, Essequirene in Paris. And we launched. Before we launched, Steve McDonald and I spent three months talking to the leaders of about 72 organizations in Burundi, asking them, did they buy in? Because we didn't want to start unless everyone bought in from all sides and then asking them if they were organizing their choice of the first 35 people, who would they choose? The criteria being we only wanted people who were so influential by virtue of their positions or their, inf or their reputations that they could impact others. Influential for better or for worse. We weren't looking just for the good guys. We also wanted the troublemakers. But we ended up with about 15 or 16 lists but everyone felt invited to join the process. And we ended up with 342 names. And we could see which names kept popping up on everyone's list, Hutu and Tutsi. Uh, I remember there were a couple of uh, Tutsis who were e extreme, damn it, uh, who, were, who, who, who were extremists, who everyone warned us, don't invite, because they were so extreme that they would undermine the process for everyone else. But when we saw that that's who Hutus and Tutsi said were among the keys to their future, we felt we had to invite them. And because we were an NGO, not a government, we could do that. 
And so we did that, and they, no one changed more dramatically than these two individuals, because there had been fear that had been driving their extremism. And once we could cut through the fear, it all was eliminated. And what the process consisted of was beginning with a six-day workshop, a retreat, and then following that up every two or three months with two or three days shorter experiences. Because that first six days is enormously transformative. People come out of it, and these are bitter enemies who've never been in the same room with each other, uh, professing that, my God, they can't see the world now like they used to. But then they go back and do their constituencies where they've not had, no one else has had that training or that experience. So you've got to constantly reinforce their new insights and new vision and, and strengthen their skills. Well, within six months, we had built so much cohesion among the first 65 leaders that we began our work with that the military leadership, the leadership of the military, and we were blessed to have an enlightened military uh, chief of staff who was visionary, who was a risk taker, who recognized the potential of this work, and who sanctioned his top generals joining the process. And they asked, could we bring together the top gen military commanders from the army and, and six rebel groups into a retreat to prepare for the ceasefire that had not yet been signed? So we brought 37 people from the battlefield into the workshop in Nairobi, only time we worked outside of the country. And I don't know who was for, more frightened the first day or two, they or we, but by the end of those six days, they had built the same cohesion, the same camaraderie, though we were then asked to extend that work as widely and quickly as possible. We trained up 84 ex-combatants to serve as mixed groups of observers excuse me, of the whole DDR process. The chief of staff then asked us to train up the ceasefire commission, to train up a hundred top commanders of the army. The police came to us, asked us to do the same. And then um, we were asked to train trainers for their military academy. Uh, and then the politicians came to us, including the president, and asked us to train up his new cabinet council and to work with the parliamentary leaders. All of that work continues to this day. But it's been a remarkable story, and the last thing I will close on. Burundi is still a very troubled state, enormous insecurity, uh, and a lot of conflict right now at the grassroots level among Hutus, nonviolent conflict. But two things. One is, no longer is the Tutsi-Hutu discourse relevant. That's disappeared, which is amazing given the history. Secondly, the army is as cohesive and, and professional as any African military, doing great work in Somali now in peacekeeping and peace building, serving as a symbol of national unity. Because of that success, we were invited into Congo, into Liberia, and East Timor. But more on that later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolfie. So thank you to our four panelists for giving us such an understanding of the challenges and opportunities, and I know each of them could have easily spoken for the full hour. So we appreciate your efforts at being brief. We open the floor to questions. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Grazia Goseco. I work at the Institute for Multitrack Diplomacy. I have a question about metrics and in peacemaking. It was mentioned by Dr. Abu Nimber that it is a challenge um, and also by Mrs. Bernard that it's a problem for to to you I mean, it's a problem when reporting back to donors to determine if the project has been a success or not. Is there any I mean at this point um, is anyone doing research on it or uh, perhaps in Dr. Bartoli's school has anyone <laughs> been working on metrics of peace building? Okay. Why don't we take a couple questions? I know there are going to be many. Hi there. My name is Atamantan. Uh, I'm from the Bahu. Development Institute based in Thailand, focus on Burma. And we have been working for the uh, Burmese 
community development in affiliation with the Chemang University, our organization is working. And we are now moved to the peace building process and we are the capacity building. And my questions to the panelists, and I think that Dr. Ya and Dr. Wab, you discuss about the military establishment. So our difficulty is still in our, in our country, the, what we are facing is that we are very hard to crack open these like, hard organizations. And so would you please to share your experience or ideas how to open the track to the military establishment? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my name is Philip Lustenberger. I'm studying uh, conflict management. My question goes to uh, Howard Wolpe. Um, this process, as you describe it, uh, working with these peace or conflict workshops, is also done a lot at the, the grassroots level. Um, do you think this, oh, at the grassroots level, this can have a similar impact, or is it the tendency of people to fall back in the old dynamics? Is it is it bigger? Um, so, how does this play play into the whole picture? Thanks, Ambassador German. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, actually, mine will kind of uh, be a little bit relative to the first question that was asked. And I was thinking about the idea of rebuilding relationships that I think you had mentioned. And I was curious of that idea to me can mean a lot of different things. It can mean reopening economic pathways. It can be a variety of different things. And I guess I was curious about the idea of humility that you spoke about and kind of the, is it is it a part of this process to be sensitive instead of with a directive plan and to and to be working at whatever level of the track there is that there is that opportunity where there's there is a sense of legitimacy and there is a sense of desire for it and uh, and how that's related to the idea of success and how that's measured where you know um it i understand that there's a there's a, a disconnect between accountability and evaluation in some regards and so i'm curious is it is it fair to to kind of have a certain metric for what we call quote unquote success like you had mentioned the uh, the failure that you had discussed and the Israel Palestine you thought actually exposed a great opportunity to 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 move things forward in a different way so i'm curious about the idea of success and how it's measured one last question mm -hmm. ambassador gribben and then uh, I'm Robert Griffin, a retired U.S. ambassador. My question has to do with uh, uh, NGOs and others who get involved in the second track process. Uh, obviously, governments have long-term interest and want to stay involved no matter what. But uh, for uh, second track, you, you need to be invited in and to be a useful participant. But how effective is a threat to withdrawal? Uh, did you use that in Burundi or in Mozambique or Sierra, uh, Sri Lanka? NGO withdrawal? Yes. Okay, thank you. I, I have, uh, if you don't mind, just one comment on the evaluation aspect. I Since 2008-9, I've been doing research and trying to uh, gather information. I've interviewed about 50, actually 38 international evaluators that major donors use them, and I uh, try to see what do they think about the field of peace building, how do they evaluate. Uh, we have a problem in the field itself that there are very little professional, uh, qualified, competent social scientists who have the tools of uh, methodology to go in and evaluate peace building program. We have an issue with the donors who just recently uh, began really forcing our field to come up with evidence that we are indeed effective and have impact. But at the same time, they're using measuristic of quantitative, and we cannot provide the quantitative because most of us are trained qualitatively, and most of us love uh, stories. And stories can be captured in numbers, so the donors are frustrated that we only tell them stories and we don't give numbers. And also, how could you build the measure relationships in numbers? when we talk about building relationship and transformation. So the, the, the problem is not only within our field in terms of the people we train and the schools we have and the courses we teach, but it's also in the donor community who give us the funds to do the work in defining what type of uh, evaluation criteria they want. And secondly, the fact that all of us under the mercy of the international donor who basically have defined uh, peace building work like development work three to five years cycle. So in the middle of your project basically they pull out the funds and then you have to go and look for other funds and start the cycle again. And the threat, the sword of the donor 
on the peace builder work is one of the major problem why you can't show and give enough attention to the evidence of peace building and the outcome that we have. So, and the donor is one of the main tracks that we have in the multi-track diplomacy, and that's another area where neither us nor the donor have taken seriously the notion of not looking for generic metrics. The debate in our field right now, should we generate uh, one matrix, one yardstick, and go globally and measure success, or we leave that locally, contextually, to emerge based on the project and the people that we have. Unfortunately, and I'll close with this and leave the room with no message here, but I, I have an evaluator went with me to Sri Lanka who wanted to use the same survey used in Kosovo to measure success of one uh, health program and be used in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Trincomalee on uh, Sinhala Muslim and the uh, Tamil community peace building program without even changing the, 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 the sequence of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and Matrix said. don't work. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I do apologize. I Does anyone else want to address evaluation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, Emmanuel? If I may just to quickly support that, um, in terms of, uh, I mean, we're confronted with uh, the the very basic challenge of, you know, how do you how do you show that if you're doing prevention, how do you show that something didn't happen? Um, Obviously, every day we, we, we have that problem. And all, secondly, in terms of measuring success, when we were working um, on, indeed, like a project cycle, three years, five years, when you're working on like that on an issue that is not linear, that can go one way, one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward, and like that, it's also difficult to show success. Um, uh, so what we're trying to do in, in UNDP is try to uh, obviously uh, get some flexibility from the donors, from our, from our uh, partners in terms of not only not using the word evaluation, but more impact, more looser terms for reporting that do involve storytelling. And that is based on a thorough sort of analysis at the beginning, a qualitative understanding of what the dynamics of conflict are in a way that is more in-depth than what the UN or the UNDP is, is used to in other thematic areas like DDR or rule of law, which are a lot more you know, straightforward technical areas. So that's what we try to do, use the storytelling with a baseline, even though the word is, may not be ideal, um, of thorough qualitative analysis where Afterwards, we can try to explain, portray what the impact was, but it's difficult. Thanks. Yes, you need to go. So I didn't know if you wanted to address any of the questions, particularly the one on the relationships uh, uh, let me get to or evaluation. Uh, uh, the first one was how to open track um, uh, contact to the military. Uh, I can tell you what we do. Um, in my ECF, uh, in my little organization, we have uh, most of our senior um, participants, uh, workers are former brigadier generals or major, gen major generals. So we work with them. They are part of the former system. They work into the system. We had other cases where we asked the um, general to prepare a concept paper, and we worked on that, which, by the way, worked, which was an interesting one. So there's to, to get the security people on the board by simply including them in your work. Um, this has a little bit to do with the second question of humility. I, when I speak about humility, I mean humility in regard to the concept that you develop. Um, the, the concept you develop has to be accept, acceptable by a government that you don't necessarily in love with. Um, and um, and th this is a sense of humility. You cannot, I, I'll tell you in Israeli terms, the Geneva concept is wonderful. It's totally unacceptable to the government. They didn't have the humility, so the effect is relatively very low. Um, on deciding on the metrics, um, uh, I think one can do some thinking on it. I believe that track two is successful also if it ends in an understanding that this concept doesn't work, which is an interesting outcome of a track two activity. But it's an important, it's an important instrument for, for the decision makers. Um, track two, um, what you would need in a matrix is an understanding, and that should be part of it, that the real effective word of an NGO is, 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 it is how to clap hands with two hands. We, we have asked, for instance, our donors, 
I'll be more specific. I don't go into the details, but we'll ask USAID, who are giving us a nice amount of money, do we come up with concepts? And they afterwards asked all the, sp the, the stakeholders to be there, and then we see how this is done and how this is the capacity building is done. But it needs both sides to do it. So the metrics mean mind we want to check also the other side if they're doing their job, which they sometimes are doing very well. But um, um, so that's part of it. But you can think on them. I believe you can think on the metrics. So that will be everything. If to NGO to take out, I don't want to. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Howard. Mm. Uh, let me finish off the discussion of, of the metrics before moving on. Um, I think it's fair to say that none of us are satisfied with where we've come in terms of our ability to measure impact. Uh, in our own work, uh, we've had a, a number of different approaches we've taken from the use of focus groups that have been brought together in the military, for example, uh, to, um, con to, to, to discuss the behavior of their military colleagues who have both had the training and those that have not. And that's been, has yielded some very interesting insights. We've had some independent studies undertaken by uh, uh, the World Bank and by the UN uh, DP as well of our work in Congo and in, and in Burundi that have yielded quite a bit of knowledge. Um, for me, I'm not that anxious to focus upon measuring the stuff quantitatively. I don't know how you do that, and I don't think that'll get us very far. I can, what I do when I'm asked is, uh, can I demonstrate what the impact has been in Burundi, is point to specific instances in which the work had produced positive outcomes that would not have otherwise been produced. Um, I, I brought, well, recently I was in Burundi and I was introducing our new ambassador, this was actually a couple of years ago, I guess now, uh, to uh, the, mil the Minister of Defense, who was the, the chief of staff who had, inspired, who had welcomed and sanctioned all this work with the military originally. And he must have spent about five or ten minutes discussing with the ambassador that the training that his command officers had received is the reason why they were able to overcome this terribly uh, bloody a polarized division between Hutu and Tutsi and build a cohesive military. And he was asking that, that more of this work be done and begun to be extended to lower ranks of the military as well. Um, I think of the work that the education ministry now, and this was a Burundian suggestion, people kept saying to us, you know, we need to start this work with kids. And so uh, at the Burundian initiative, we now have a major program that USAID underwrote um, of building a whole secondary school curriculum in non-violent conflict resolution, and that involves also the training of secondary school teachers. And now money is being, so, and the demonstration was so successful that the minister wants to scale up quickly to the entire nation and also even extend to the primary school level. Um, we had, uh, we've had these marvelous moments of, of uh, military observers coming back to us where they had to defuse some very difficult situations and use the techniques they had learned in the workshop. And they were so ecstatic because they discovered that that worked better than confrontation. And they, and they would share that with us. And that's a pretty tangible set of outcomes that you can point to. Now, I should say something else, though. This is no panacea. Uh, in the Congo, for example, I can give you as many illustrations of success and impact. In fact, it was when our ambassador, I, I, I used to, when I left government, I would still go back and be invited to get, do briefings for the um, Africa Bureau periodically on the Congo and on Burundi, because I was still working in those countries. And I'd go in there and I'd discuss this stuff and eyes would glaze over and, uh, and there was just no impact. But then when the ambassador sent a, sent a cable in after our initial workshops in Kinshasa with some of the top leaders who had never been in the same room with each other mm -hmm. and had huge impact and spinning off a lot of other activity, and he had sent out this cable. So, and when I walked into that room a few weeks later to do another briefing, suddenly people were paying attention and they, want, and they were asking questions and there was a whole different level of engagement. 
but we have a, a long ways to go. Now, that leads nicely, I think, into the other question I was asked about how do you get the military involved. One way is using other military that you have access to. Uh, but in my experience, none of this works unless you can somehow um, bring together two worlds, the world of diplomacy and the world of the trainers. The trainers have skills in conflict transformation and how to build cohesion and how to overcome trust. Diplomats, I discovered, much to my amazement, have no such training. Um, but diplomats do have access to national leaders. They do understand the politics of the society and of the region. What I had going for me in both Burundi and in Congo was that I served as a bridge between those two worlds. I had built up the credibility and the knowledge and the experience and the contacts uh, several years of special envoy work, which then enabled me to reach out to my interlocutors on in all sides of the conflict. And that made the job immeasurably easier. In some places we don't have that and we have to figure out other ways, other points of entry. But you do need to join up these two worlds much more systematically. Um, and on the humility issue, um, the our point of view is that we are not there to provide any guidance or direction, and we have no game plan. We constantly insist that ours is a participant-based process, that we are facilitators that can get, provide some tools and some skills and, and a space, but that it is for the participants to decide what issues they want to work on, how they want to work together, what they want to focus on. Yeah, excuse me, and I think that's one of the reasons we've maintained our credibility in these societies. In fact, on several different occasions, we've had a mediate between the United Nations and our participants, because the UN had felt it had become a partisan entity. But we had never fell into that trap. Um, and then finally, on the issue of, um, not, not two, two last points, uh, on the uh, uh, grass works, grassroots issue. Absolutely, this kind of work needs and should be undertaken at the grassroots level. In fact, most of the work that's been done in this area has been done at the grassroots. And my criticism coming into the field was that we had not been working at the decision making level. Why? Because too few trainers had access to the decision makers. So they did what was easier they reached people in the villages. The second point I'd make is that I wish we would think more strategically and holistically when we approach these issues. And what that means is you can't begin work unless you have the, the proper environment, both in the region and in the country. Steve and I spent months not just speaking to key Burundians, getting their buy-in, helping them identify who were the people that needed to be invited, but we also traveled the region with all the countries that were involved in hosting or facilitating the peace process. Because we did not want them to feel we were setting up an alternative negotiating venue. We did not want them to feel threatened by the work we were doing. And eventually, not only did they not feel threatened, they welcomed it. Because they saw it as an adjunct, making their job easier than, rather than more difficult. Um, on the withdrawal issue, we never felt a need to make that threat. But there are in some places, <clears throat> let me, uh, the best example being Uganda, where we were invited in. People, uh, some high levels in the peace process, wanted us in because they felt the Uganda process was going nowhere. But when I looked around the field and I saw how many international players were trying to do something, I decided that it wasn't worth the effort. Unless you have one process that is internationally sanctioned by one central organization, be it the World Bank, the United Nations, or what have you, um, and unless you have the buy-in not only of the president but of the, the nasty actors on the other side, I don't like to begin to work. I want to have that buy-in first. So it's very labor-intensive trying to build confidence, explain the process, and then you can begin.
Okay, well, thank you very much. I think, are we supposed to go to the reception, Steve? Is that what Yeah, I moved up here to kind of hint that, yes. Or can I take a couple more questions? Okay, good, because I last, think there's a lot point. of interest in the... Yes, please. About the military. Well, if you want to be heard on the webcast, you do. So just wait one half second, John. It's coming right around. Uh, we're bringing you a microphone. It's, it's, coming. it's right here. Need one. Yes, it's coming. Uh, here. It appears. There you are. Oh, thank you. I'd like to make a comment on a mm. program we have at the National Defense University here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm a graduate of the National War College many years ago, and now we have a three-star general uh, overviewing a whole collection of, of groups at, uh, at uh, Fort McKnight. In 2005, I proposed that we teach a course to the colonels and senior civilians. This is the senior training arm in the U.S. government uh, on conflict resolution and peace building. And I pointed out that this would be the first time in the history of the U.S. military that this subject would be taught. It took about a year and a half but a three-star general finally approved it, and we started in January of 2007, a uh, semester-long course, 12 weeks, uh, only two hours every Wednesday afternoon. Uh, but we had seven speakers, including myself, Mohammed Abu Nimer, and now Dr. Bartoli, among others. And the goal of the course was stated very simply in the first five minutes. We want to teach you that there are other ways than the gun to solve conflict. We've now graduated 108 colonels from 35 countries, and our current class of 19 has 10 nationalities in it. So what we're doing is to try to impact on the military to think outside the box and other ways to build peace aside from the gun. I thought that would be of interest to this group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Maria Posey, a student at Uppsala University in Sweden. And uh, speaking of the metrics, I just want to commend that we have been working very hard to try to establish some of these um, measurements, not only in conflict, but also in peacemaking and peace building. And then I have a question, um, potentially mostly for Mr. Wolp, who has had a very amazing career both in government and uh, working in the nonprofit sector. And so you understand the importance of buy-in, not only on the host people and the recipients, but also of the people here in the US and in Europe that are you know, potentially putting up the money indirectly for these programs. And I'm a little bit disheartened looking around in Europe with sort of more conservative or ultra-conservative groups gaining power, um, shunning refugees, shunning immigration, sort of a general fear in closing the doors rather than the kind of opening up that we all in this room agree is so necessary. So especially your views on this issue and, and what can be done to encourage buy-in, not only on the recipients, but also on the providers. Thank you very much. Great. Any one or two last questions? Hi, Sean Dunning with uh, Search for Common Ground. Uh, Quick question. I'll try to make it quick. Um, Dr. Wolpe, I thought your, your story was quite compelling, particularly around the point of bringing together those who might be considered or actually are enemies. And by virtue of spending some time together, and there's a lot to how that together happens, but by virtue of that time together, out of it, they are transformed. And I think many of us know from experience this will work. I've had the, 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 the pleasure to work with some Israeli and Palestinian leaders. And there's no question whatsoever that at the end of that, that transformative time together, they see each other differently and they see the world differently. And they may say, well, my politics aren't different, but now you're my friend. I don't want to see you hurt. So we have to find another way. And that's the transformation. That's, that's the shift. The question is, how do we take that to scale? You know, our mission at SEARCH is to transform how the world deals with conflict. I think we need like a barometer, you know, a thermometer on our website that says, you know, out of seven million or seven billion, you know, how many served, right? <laughs> um, 
so we know, in other words, that we make a difference with those whom we, who, who we, with whom we interact on that micro level. How do we take that trust building to the masses? Howard? Yeah. Or um, on the first question, um, bo both very good questions. Um, I mean, I share the same concern about the United States that you've expressed uh, for Europe in terms of a new tendency to try to close people out instead of remain inclusive and open. Uh, and, and that's a real danger. And it, um, I, I had opportunity uh, a few years ago to be at a conference on, um, uh, at, at Essex, Irenae, and it was a morning that there had been some major riots over throughout Paris and the Arab quarters mainly. And so they created a special workshop that began at 8 in the morning that was not going to be on the program originally. And I was invited to join this panel. And it was fascinating to hear one Frenchman after another stand up who were well-intended. And they reminded me of Americans in the 60s who wanted to do the right thing. And the right thing, in their view, was changing Arabs so they'd be more like us. Uh, or changing blacks, they'd be more like us. Rather than looking at the dynamics of power in the society and at the discriminatory mechanisms that were in place in, in, in France as in other countries. Um, it, it was really stunning. I mean, you, you could have, and, and when I would offer up some examples of what we tried to do in America and in Kalamazoo, where I was sitting on the city council back in the, in the 60s, and we had lots of racial conflict in the community. And, um, and we brought together um, blacks and whites. I even got the whole police department to commit a day where everyone who was off duty would come in civilian clothes and sit down in small groups. And we did these workshops with, with the blacks and the Hispanics and other youth with whom the confrontations were occurring. And as an illustration of how we began to try to transcend the traditional barriers and stereotypes and, and eyes glazed over. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the French just did not get it. They had this intellectual commitment to equality and, and all of that, but they didn't understand how in their behavior they were expressing unconsciously uh, their supremacy or the sense of supremacy. Now, these, so these are big issues, and, and I think there's a lot of things that can be done at the local levels in some of these communities using some of the techniques that have been used in the United States over many years. Uh, my mother and I have done a lot of work in racially divided communities uh, years ago in, in, in the United States uh, using simulations and using interactive techniques. We assemble mixed groups of uh, black and white leaders and for a one day experience that had profound impact. We used to have newspaper publishers coming out of these workshops and writing whole op-eds critiquing themselves and their behavior in their communities based upon the insights they received from this kind of work. Um, so that's the kind of thing I, the only thing I can suggest at this point. If you get a progressive leader in these countries, that can obviously help. If you get a leader that plays to the lowest common denominator and just feeds the prejudices and the passions, that makes it much more difficult. Thank God we've got uh, a leader in, in our own country right now who who understands that and who really uh, tries to frame issues in ways that are unifying rather than dividing. Um, on the second question um, related to um, how do you scale up and what, what, what's the key to the process, uh, that, that's a fascinating question. We, we struggle with it. We've talked about lots of things. There, there are a couple of principles that I would throw out that I don't think we are very self-conscious about. I don't like the word dialogue. And I realize that most people in this field use the word dialogue as part of the conventional language. I, I, I hate the word. Because for me, what dialogue un unintentionally suggests is a substantive discussion of issues, and about the issues that divide people. Um, I've never understood why diplomats think it makes sense to take people who have been in conflict, who don't trust each other, who are suspicious of one another, and bring them together to start as the starting point of their conversation uh, to, to, to deal with the issues that divide them. And that's, I think that's nonsense. So the approach that we've taken and the work that we do is for the first three days of our work 
it is confidence building, basically. It is trust building. It is giving people communications and negotiating skills. It is dealing with none of the issues that underlie the conflict in that country. And what we have found, it only takes three days of this very intense work of simulations and interactive exercises uh, to help people get beyond their stereotypes and their divisions to begin to look at individuals uh, as individuals, not as parts of groups or through their political prisms. Then they can take that new found, um, the new paradigm that they've built up and then apply it to their work. So when they sit down as a working group to deal with issues of corruption or issues of economic development or, or, or the military or whatever, they do so as members of a team that have different points of view, but where they're there to try to combine those points of view to come up with solutions that will satisfy everyone, rather than as competitors trying to make points with each other. It's a totally transformed environment. It is very exciting to watch. Liz, can I make one quick interjection yes. on the Absolutely. Uh, on the scaling up uh, question? Uh, uh, obviously, re reaching a critical mass of seven billion is is impossible. We'll never be able to train that many people. Uh, and and a lot of people, when they look at the work that Howard and I have done and Liz have done in uh, uh, in in Burundi and Liberia, say, well, yeah, small countries. Uh, you know, small populations, uh, uh, but how do you take that to to a DRC, and then how do you take that to an Afghanistan? How do you, you know, when you, when you start talking about, well, I think one of the keys that Howard was describing earlier, and I think also that uh, John McDonald referred to, uh, is dealing with leadership. If you change the paradigm of leadership, you begin to change the paradigm down the track. Uh, I, I think it's that access to leadership that was one of the key missing dimensions all along uh, that we've tried to accomplish and that other multi-track uh, diplomacy uh, efforts have tried to accomplish. Uh, and, and that's not dismissing the huge importance of working at grassroots level, community to community, uh, uh, e even family and, 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 and other issues. Uh, we've done that as well. Liz led a, a project for us, a community-based leadership project, and working with uh, local level leaders uh, traditional and non-traditional, uh, formal and informal, uh, trying to deal with the refugee inflows and, uh, and displaced persons problems that were being created in Burundi as, as, as the war came to an end. Those things have to be done, but, but the way it becomes ingrained is, is twofold, and they've both been mentioned here. One of them is take it to the schools, start making your children think differently, create curriculums of conflict re re resolution, and to deal with leadership elements. Thanks. Mention uh, our community development program. Emmanuel has a comment as well? Yeah, I wanted to quickly talk about grassroots and um, and sort of the bottom-up approach. I like uh, Dr. Wolpe's example. I'm from France, so <laughs> it speaks to me, uh, definitely on a personal level. I think one thing that I wanted to mention, and uh, I, I partly lived through it, I think, is um, during the, the times of the riots in France, um, uh, I think one thing that wasn't seen very much in media, and particularly in the international media, is aside from the violence that lasted, you know, uh, th those few days, and that was terrible, the, the work that was coming, or the actions and the discourse that was coming from some of those suburbs, uh, difficult suburbs that are, um, you know, majority, um, composed in majority of, of Arabs and blacks and, uh, and socially marginalized groups in France, and some of them are white, actually. Um, and I think a lot, of the, a lot of the discourse that was coming from those um, suburbs was positive, even before, during, and after the violence. I think there's a huge effort in those communities, particularly by you know, youth leaders and, and, and several sort of champions in these communities, to find the right words to articulate some of the um, issues of social mar marginalization, of discrimination, of racism that is being, um, that, that, that they suffer through. And, you know, I think it's important for them, what is impressive in that is that in spite of the um, inability sometimes of the leadership to understand or to see those issues, there is a constant effort to find the right language to make them see it and to make them understand it. And that's absolutely key. 
Um, and, you know, both are needed to, in order to eventually find a solution. Another example, if I may just quickly, that is sort of close to me personally is Guinea, Guinea Conakry, where I, I partly grew up. We have a, a few um, participants here from Guinea. Um, when you look at 2007 of the massive sort of historical change that happened in great part through the trade unions, where you had mass demonstrations against the the leadership under L'Ancien Comté at the time, and that were done in a way that was not about violence, but that was about being responsible and finally expressing a voice and finding the words to articulate the problems in a way that the leadership could understand. The leadership didn't really, but I think that that, that effort at the grassroots level changed Guinea and gave it some of the tools uh, that it's going to need to now face this new transition, oh, post-transitional period um, in terms of maintaining peace and ensuring that whatever tensions are there are, are dealt with through words, through communication, if dialogue is not the appropriate words, but through means other than violence. Great. I think we're going to have to end as that was the sign that I got from Steve. Please feel free to keep this conversation going during the reception and I think Emmanuel's examples are great uh, to end on in terms of our whole theme of really where multi-track diplomacy takes us. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, and, and thank both panels please. <laughs>